Hello and welcome to the course Introduction to Brain and Behavior. I am Dr. Ark Verma from IIT Kanpur. I am working with the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences and also with the program in Cognitive Sciences at the institute. This is the third week and today we will start talking about the neuroscience of sensation and perception. Now, sensation and perception are uh, one of the most important are basically the first mental functions that we can talk about and which represent our interaction with the environment around us. It is primarily our ability to sense and perceive the environment in sophisticated ways that seems to basically ensure our survival through the course of evolution. Basically, uh, it is our ability to perceive, say for example, the um, uh, stimulation of uh, temperature and uh, the uh, coldness or hotness of air and things like whether something is uh, wet or it is dry or something like that. Or say for example, our ability to uh, see clearly, hear clearly, uh, all of that is what basically makes us the living organisms that we are. And that is something that is uh, very, very essential to us uh, surviving uh, as organisms or as uh, species uh, during the course of this evolution. Now, uh, I'm, I have discussed this at, at length in the course uh, on uh, advanced cognitive processes, actually basic cognitive processes that I have taken earlier. Uh, but uh, uh, researchers, uh, scientists in the cognitive psychology uh, distinguished between sensation and perception. These two are different terms, so let us try and be clear on them. Sensation basically uh, refers to the main act of receiving the stimulus from the environment uh, and its transduction or conversion into neural impulses which can then be processed by the brain. So, the idea is that all of these sensory organs that we have, the eyes, uh, the ear, the tongue, uh, the uh, nose and the skin uh, as one of the sensory organs, basically they receive all the sensory stimuli that the environment has to present to us and then they c try and convert the uh, convert this sensory stimulation into neural impulses which can then be communicated to the brain and then the brain can sort of process the stimulation and decide our next course of action. So, this is something that is uh, very very important. So, as I was saying sensation refers to the reception of this physical stimulus and its transduction or conversion into neural impulses which can then be processed by the brain. Perception on the other hand refers to all what happens later. Uh, it basically refers to the subsequent processing events that create a mental representation of the stimulus or the percept. Now, basically whatever sensations you uh, receive or whatever sensations we receive and we want to process them, uh, that is not really the final form on which the brain takes a decision on whether to act in a particular manner on the stimulation. The brain actually sees uh, or say for example, the brain actually works on the percept that is actually a mental representation of whatever stimulation has been received. Uh, a very good example of uh, what is the difference between uh, the sensation that is falling uh, upon our uh, eyes for example, let us take uh, versus the perception that we are actually getting is basically coming through these visual illusions. If you can see the figure on the right, figures on the Right, you can see that both of these figures uh, are actually by uh, are actually uh, amenable to two kinds of uh, perceptions. You can see both a young woman and an old woman in this uh, picture on the top, and you can see actually a bird or a, a rabbit uh, on the picture on the um, on the bottom. Even though the sensation that is being received from this stimulus is uh, identical and it is not really changing uh, with respect to what is happening on our eyes. But we can actually make two meanings out of it uh, depending upon wh where actually we are focusing. So, uh, perception is, is basically a process that involves uh, processing of these uh, sensory stimulations on the five senses. Now, several questions actually have been raised upon uh, the nature of these, uh, you know, nature of uh, how we uh, sense or how we receive the inputs and also how do we convert the sensory inputs into perceptual, uh, you know, representations. So, there is a lot of theory in this regard and if you want to have a more detailed discussion about it, I uh, propose that you can go and see those lectures where I have discussed this in some detail. There is a lot of questions say for example, whether, uh, you know, uh, what we see uh, or actually what we perceive is veridical or not and you know some of that can be explained through the examples that I just gave. Now, in this chapter we will basically process some of these processes, we will uh, survey some of these processes, we will see how sensations are received from the environment, what are the neural pathways that help us uh, receive these sensations, convert them into uh, neural signals that can then be processed by the brain and what is the processing that the brain eventually does 
on these uh, sensory inputs and how does it uh, kind of give us a sense of uh, let us say how to act uh, with respect to any of these particular stimuli. Uh, early perceptual processing basically refers to uh, the initial uh, parts of uh, the processing cycle wherein the stimulation has just been received uh, by the sensory organs and it basically uh, uh, refers to the process of uh, after uh, these stimulations have been received how are they conveyed to the brain. Now the process begins with each sensory organ, we talked about five sensory organs uh, receiving the sensory stimulation for instance the outer ear, the ear canal and the inner ear receive the sound waves, they funnel it and they funnel the sound waves inside the ears and then they concentrate and amplify these sound waves which can then basically be transduced uh, by the hair cells or the receptors uh, in the inner ear in, inside the uh, basilar membrane in the cochlea and then how is that information conveyed to the uh, primary and secondary auditory cortices. In case of the eye, the pupils dilate or constrict to allow less or more light entering the retina and basically once the right amount of uh, light is entered the retina, uh, the cornea and the lens adjust to focus the falling light on the retina. We know that, uh, we will actually talk about this also, We've, we know that the retina contains these photoreceptor cells called rods and cones and they are basically uh, responsible for converting the ray of light uh, or the physical stimulation from the light into neural impulses which can then be conveyed to the other parts of the brain. So this is uh, one of the things. Now next is this process of transduction. Once the uh, simulation has been received and uh, it has been transduced by these specialized receptor cells into neural impulses, how are these uh, neural impulses conveyed to different areas of the brain? Now, uh, say for example, uh, let us uh, try and understand that in detail. Olfactory signals are relayed to the uh, pr primary uh, olfactory cortex uh, through the olfactory nerve, visual signals through the optic nerve, auditory signals through the auditory or cochlear nerve, taste uh, uh, signals through the facial and the glossopharyngeal nerves, facial sensation uh, say for example touch sensations of the face through the trigeminal nerve. The rest of the body sends its uh, sensory uh, uh, signals through the sensory nerves that synapse at the dorsal roots of the spinal cord and enters the brain stem uh, through there. So this is one of the, this is basically the ways how the sensory stimulation received on these uh, sensory organs is can be conveyed to the different regions of the brain. Now the sensory nerves along with the glossopharyngeal nerves which are responsible for taste and the vestibulo cochlear, cochlear nerve which is basically uh, responsible for audit, uh, auditory, processing auditory information and pro proprioceptive information about the body balance etc. enter the brain through the medulla and then travel up the spinal cord. The facial nerve enters the brainstem around the uh, pontomedullar junction where the, whereas the trigeminal nerve basically uh, coincides at the pons. So this is, uh, these are the ways how these uh, very important uh, sensory nerves are coinciding or connecting with the brain. All of these nerves terminate in different parts of the thalamus. So thalamus basically as we have discussed earlier uh, acts as a relay station that conveys all of this incoming sensory information to different parts of the brain to the different uh, you know uh, cortices that process uh, these, uh, a, these uh, bits of information. Now the optic nerve basically uh, travels from the eye socket to the optic chiasma where there is this uh, crossover of uh, part of the optic nerve happening actually uh, crossover to uh, project information the contralateral sides which is basically from the coming from the two nasal hemifields and uh, uh, part of uh, them basically go directly through the ipsilateral cortex. Now, Neural messages from each of these uh, senses are uh, relayed on to uh, primary and secondary uh, sensory cortices uh, from the thalamus. So the primary sensory cortices are basically let us say the primary visual cortex or the primary auditory cortex which receive the sensation first hand and then they can after initial processing convey the information to the secondary auditory cortices where in this info sensory information is integrated with information from the other senses and processes like evaluation of emotion uh, you know uh, uh, consulting the memory etc can take place. Now the olfactory nerve being the shortest cranial nerve, uh, it already terminates at around the olfactory bulb while uh, the um, axons from this uh, olfactory bulb actually project directly to the primary and the secondary olfactory cortices without passing through the thalamus or the brain stem. So the olfactory system is slightly unique in the sense that uh, the information from the olfactory nerve does not really really through the thalamus but directly connects to the primary and the secondary olfactory cortices. So this is also something that you will need to remember.
Now, let us look in at uh, you know in more general about uh, the properties of these sensory receptors. Now, these receptor cells across these different sensory modalities have some common characteristics. For example, the receptor cells cannot respond until the stimulation has been that is being received uh, crosses a minimum intensity level or a minimum threshold. Uh, until then, uh, there will be no firing of uh, action potentials in these receptor cells. Uh, Let us talk about uh, some generic properties of these receptor cells, say for example, range. The receptor cells of every modality such as vision, audition, touch, taste, etcetera, uh, respond to stimuli within a limited range only. For example, uh, I am sure it is known to all of you from class 6 physics is that the uh, range of our color vision is, uh, any, is uh, uh, between 400 to 700 nanometers. Similarly, our range of hearing is between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. Now, these ranges uh, are uh, typical for humans, but are not common or shared across all species. For example, certain birds and insects uh, actually have receptors that allow them to see ultraviolet light. Uh, another property is adaptation. Now, uh, all of these sensory receptors can adapt to the uh, dynamicity of the environment, can adapt to the changing levels of stimulation within the environment. Say for example, our ears, uh, when you enter a, a very noisy place uh, initially, your ears will initially get startled and you will be very sensitive to the sound. But if you spend enough time in that room, uh, gradually the ears adapt to that level of noise and uh, you start feeling the sound uh, much less intensely. Similarly, say for example, if you walk directly into a dark room from while you are coming uh, you know from uh, area of adequate light, uh, initially it, it is a bit difficult to uh, you know spot even your hands for example. But uh, if you spend uh, you know 5 minutes, 10 minutes into the room, uh, your eyes sort of adjust, the pupil uh, dilates to allow more light inside and uh, therefore, you can sort of start seeing a little bit as at least as, uh, as uh, much as possible with respect to that uh, level of uh, illumination. So, this is basically a demonstration of the fact that uh, the receptor cells are uh, very uh, capable of adapting to different kinds of uh, stimulation situations. Uh, as far as acuity is concerned, acuity basically refers to uh, the uh, capability of the receptor cells uh, of dis being able to distinguishing uh, different uh, yeah, stimuli uh, within each modality. Uh, basically, it uh, refers to the accuracy of perception uh, of each of these uh, you know different kinds of uh, stimulation. Now, acuity of perception uh, may depend upon a variety of factors. Say, for example, uh, one could be the design of the uh, stimulus collection system. Say, for example, our ears are designed in such a way that they can allow the concentration or the funneling of sounds uh, towards the inside of the ear. Uh, in the inner ear and uh, so on. Uh, the other uh, could be the distribution of receptors. Say, for example, uh, we know of certain dogs and cats, say, for example, they can actually orient their ears to the source of sound so as to allow more, um, you know, a clear perception of that kind of sound. Uh, similarly, say, for example, uh, if you talk about visual acuity or uh, the clarity of visual perception, the visual acuity is basically best at the central regions of the uh, of the retina where there is this, uh, where there is this. Uh, fovea, which is a small region which is packed with uh, these photoreceptor cells called rods and cones, and which allow for uh, allow us uh, to see, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever stimulus is out there with absolute and maximum clarity. Apart from the range, adaptation, and acuity, there are actually several levels of processing that each stimulus has to go through uh, before it can be processed by the brain. Information that is received at the sensory modalities are first uh, uh, transduced into neural impulses, and then they are relayed via the sensory nerves through, uh, towards the uh, subcortical and cortical regions of the brain. But during this journey, there can be many instances, or there can be several factors that affect uh, whether this information is going to reach, uh, you know, conscious awareness, or whether the brain is going to be allowed to act uh, as per the, you know, this particular stimulation. For example, uh, a particular kind of stimuli may uh, not receive any attention, and therefore, uh, you know, may be filtered out. Or say, for example, a certain kind of stimulation enters your brain where the working memory is crowded up. Uh, because you are uh, processing other uh, stimuli or doing uh, other tasks. Uh, so, basically it may decay uh, very quickly, uh, you know, over time and it may not uh, really reach, uh, you know, awareness or conscious processing at all. So, the, this is sort of uh, and therefore, it can be said that out of the hundreds and thousands of stimuli that uh, one is processing at all times, only a very small section of the stimuli actually receive active uh, processing or reach conscious processing, where the brain is sort of decides as to what uh, you know action needs to be taken in order to process these stimuli.
Uh, another thing that we can talk about with respect to these uh, receptors is uh, basically the kind of connections that they have. Now, neural impulses typically travel both ways via the sensory pathways as we were just talking about. Uh, for instance, say for example, let's take the example of vision. Uh, sensi visual sensory pathway passes through the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. Uh, the auditory pathway passes through the medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. Similarly, the somatic uh, pathway passes through the ventral posterior nuclear complex and the gustatory pathway passes through the uh, ventral post uh, posterior medial uh, nucleus. Now, these are the different, uh, you know, uh, uh, junctions in the brain where uh, the sensory pathways actually converge and then relay the information higher regions of the brain. Now, while the thalamus is most uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, involved as a sensory uh, relay station, uh, it basically, um, it is not clear uh, as to what is it, what is the kind of processing that really happens uh, with respect to information that is descending from the higher regions of the brain towards the thalamus. One of the uh, options uh, or one of the alternatives that uh, researchers have uh, proposed is that the thalamus basically uh, participates in uh, what is called multisensory integration, where it basically tries to combine together information from these different senses and uh, you know. Uh, uh, be able to deduce uh, or say for example, form uh, holistic uh, impressions of the percept. Now, uh, the connections descending from higher cortical areas of the brain uh, towards the thalamus therefore may provide the cortex with a way to modulate the flow of information from the sensory systems and as I said, uh, integrate them if the need be. Now, we have talked about the general properties of uh, the receptors across modalities. Now, in this section, we will start considering uh, specific uh, sensory modalities and try and discuss uh, what happens uh, with respect to them in some detail. Now, uh, we will first take up uh, the sense of audition. Now, perception of sounds actually starts at the outer ear. So, this is uh, where the perception of sounds actually starts. Now, sound waves received uh, at the outer ear or pinna are concentrated inwards towards the ear canal. They are then amplified and they uh, travel inwards to hit the eardrum or the tympanic membrane, wherein they create weak vibrations on the membrane. The weak vibrations on the membrane uh, basically travel through the air air filled middle ear, the inside of the ear and they are basically, they uh, rattle three, ba uh, three very tiny bones that are there, which are called the malleus, incus and the stapes. The uh, vibration of these three uh, tiny bones causes another membrane, which is shaped like an oval window to start vibrating. Now, this oval window is basically the beginning point of this, uh, you know, uh, coiled tubular structure called the cochlea, which is a fluid filled uh, convoluted structure. Uh, this cochlea basically uh, contains uh, tiny hair cells called the cilia uh, lining the inner surface of this cochlea which is called the basilar membrane. These cilia are basically the uh, actual uh, receptor cells in the auditory system and they are special cells composed of 200 tiny filaments uh, known as stereocilia and these are what are floating inside the liquid filled cochlea. The vibrations at the oval window actually produces waves in this uh, liquid which is filled in the cochlea and hence they start deflecting these stereocilia. The stereocilia are uh, basically frequency tuned that is they respond to sounds within a particular range of frequency as per their location in the basilar membrane. This is probably because uh, the basilar membrane is uh, the thickness of this basilar membrane varies uh, from uh, you know the point at the where it is connected with the old window till the final point where it is sort of uh, coiled up. Now, the hair cells or the cilia near the old window typically respond to higher frequency vibrations in the waves, uh, whereas the hair cells uh, towards the apex of the cilia, apex of the cochlea actually respond to lowest frequencies of sound. So, this is basically how the process of receiving of the sound is actually happening. Now, this special arrangement uh, with respect to frequency of the cilia is called tonotopic organization. And the cilia basically are referred to as mechanoreceptors because as soon as they start vibrating uh, or uh, as soon as the deflection is received on the uh, along the basal membrane, mechanically gated ion channels open up uh, in these hair cells allowing more positively charged ions to get inside of uh, potassium and calcium to get inside, hence depolarizing these cells. Once these cells are depolarized, they generate an action potential which can then basically uh, lead to the uh, the uh, appearance of this nerve impulse which can, which has to then be uh, conveyed towards the higher areas of the brain. 
Now, uh, we know that natural sounds are composed of uh, you know very complex frequencies, hence uh, basically they activate a, a wide range of these hair cells. So, for example, our range of hearing is uh, as I said uh, up to 20,000 hertz, uh, the sensitivity is maximum within this range. Uh, however, the sensitivity and uh, we have enhanced sensitivity uh, of uh, receiving sounds between 1000 to 4000 hertz, which is basically the range uh, of human communication. Uh, starting from uh, a, a particular conversation somebody is having to a child crying. Now, the auditory system contains uh, several connections between the hair cells uh, that is the cilia and the cortex. The auditory nerve projects to the cochlear nuclei in the medulla which travel to the pons and then separate to innervate the left and the right olivari nuclei uh, which is a point where information from both ears is shared. The axons from these olivari nuclei uh, actually further project to the inferior colliculus in the midbrain. So, you have to sort of remember the pathways uh, as to how uh, the sound uh, waves were first received at the outer ear, how are they converted into neural impulses at the cochlea uh, using these hair cells or cilia and how are they then uh, further uh, kind of conveyed uh, to the in till the inferior co colliculi in the midbrain. Now, from the midbrain, uh, basically the auditory signals can access what are called motor structures. So, for example, uh, at, at this level, uh, motor neurons can actually orient the head towards the source of sound in order to enhance the perception or clarity of sound. Now, some axons uh, around this uh, region branch off to the nucleus of the lateral lemniscus in the midbrain, where the temporal aspects of sound is processed. Basically, uh, from the midbrain, auditory information ascends to the medial geniculate nucleus and from there to the primary auditory cortex which lies in the superior temporal. We have seen uh, where these uh, regions uh, lie typically. Now, neurons throughout this entire pathway are actually tonotopically organized. So, starting from uh, the cilia in the cochlea uh, which are uh, which were tonotopically organized to each of the neurons in the in these uh, regions of the cortex are actually tonotopically organized which means that neurons in the prime uh, rostral part of the or uh, you know rostral part or the bottom part of the primary auditory cortex will respond to lower frequency sounds whereas uh, neurons in the caudal part which is the uh, upper part of the auditory cortex will uh, high, will be highly responsive to high frequency sounds Similar arrangements can also be found in the secondary auditory cortex as well. So, uh, something that is very clear is that uh, frequencies play a very, very important role uh, in determining how the sounds will actually be perceived uh, not only inside the brain, but also not only inside the ears, but also uh, uh, to in the brain as well. Now, this is basically a graph which actually shows how the uh, informations uh, or how the projections from the cochlea reach uh, the uh, rostral medulla, uh, you know, these ventral cochlear uh, nuclei and then to the mid pons and then to the lateral lemniscus and uh, upwards till the auditory cortices. So, this is something that you probably need to remember. Now, while the primary auditory cortex is uh, supposed to be tonotopically organized on the at the gross level, uh, a closer look at uh, these uh, at the experimental studies actually re uh, reveal that at the local level there might be a degree of heterogeneity or a mix of uh, neurons which are uh, receptive to other kinds of frequencies. Because as you know, uh, complex uh, natural sounds or the sounds that we typically hear are sometimes uh, not really just uh, having containing one kind of frequencies, but uh, actually uh, containing a mix of uh, different kinds of frequencies. Now, let us talk a little bit about what is the processing that goes on uh, with respect to audition. Uh, one of the very, very important processing goals for uh, the auditory system is to determine the range of frequency variation uh, of sounds in order to be able to differentiate, let us say, things like human speech sounds from non-speech sounds and then later uh, more specific identification as to uh, determining the voice of a person or the words or the content. Another very important goal in auditory processing refers to the localization of the source of the sounds. Where are the sounds actually coming from? Another very important uh, goal in auditory processing refers to localization of the source of the sound, which has been referred to as the where problem. It is very, very useful, uh, say for example, in order to avoid, uh, you know, uh, predators or in order to locate prey uh, when you are sort of, you know, looking for something, if you can identify where the source of a sound is actually uh, located. Uh, and this is something not only limited to humans, but is used uh, ex extensively by several other species. Say for example, uh, you might be aware that bats use a technique, bats use a technique called eco-localization, wherein they use um, basically uh, the 
sounds being uh, created uh, by uh, you know where they use sounds to determine the location of the prey and also to find their own paths in the dark. In a similar manner, barn owls have been known to exploit their sense of hearing to locate food sources etc. Now, some of the cues that could help us localize uh, objects in space on the basis of sound could be differences in two things. Uh, one is the interaural time and the other is the intensity of sound that reaches the airs. Now, interaural time typically just refers to the difference of time uh, in which the sound reaches your ears. Okay. So, the difference in intensity of the sound received at both ears may not be constant or may not be uh, uh, identical uh, because of the attenuation of the sound waves uh, over time. So, both of these things uh, the difference in time uh, at which the sound reaches the left ear versus the right ear and the intensity of the sound that is registered at the left ear versus the right ear. These two cues act as very important uh, sources of information which help uh, not only humans, but other species also to identify the source of the sound. Say for example, uh, although there are very minor differences, although there are very minor differences with respect to the interaural time or the intensity of the sound, uh, intensity of the sound, these uh, minor differences can be amplified by a specialized uh, anatomical arrangement. Say for example, in case of barn owls, uh, it is uh, seen that uh, the ear are located uh, asymmetrically and therefore, what happens is uh, that the for a barn owl, the sounds coming from bottom are, uh, are, are sort of received more intensely or they appear louder uh, in the left ear than the right. Okay. So, that sort of helps the uh, barn owl actually locate where the sound is coming from. Is it coming from the down or is it coming from the upwards direction? For humans, apparently the outer ear or pinna amplifies the intensity of the sound difference, intensity of the difference between the sounds uh, received at both ears, thus facilitating localization of the sound source. So, these are some of the cues that sort of help in uh, identifying where uh, so each of the sounds are being received at. Uh, this is all about uh, audition that I wanted to see. In the next lecture, I will talk about some of the other senses. Thank you. Thank you.